So the challenge is, is for organisations to have an experience of it rather than just hearing it conceptually. So all of this is very, very nice, right? But let's move to the next question. What do you do? If, if, if someone goes, all right, I buy this to an extent, what are you going to do about this? Well, we need to get people to have a fresh understanding of how the quality of mind works. Well, how are you going to do that? You know, wh what's your tools? Wh where's the handbook? What's your techniques? Oh, we don't really have any of those. Hmm. <laughs> really? Do you have a conversation? Yeah. So then you need to give them an experience of how insight works. Now, what, what, to, what people don't see, which is what Ian pointed to so elegantly earlier, is that we are insight-creating machines. It's the way we're set up. And if you have any doubt about that, have a look at little kids. I, I was very lucky that when I first saw the principles, I had my first child. She's seven now, and I've got a five-year-old. And when people were telling me, like Michael Neal, this is true, Piers, about the human condition. This isn't some kind of made-up NLP presupposition. This is true. I was like, is it? I'd have a look in my little one to see if I could see it there. And hey, presto, who are my best teachers of the principles is the kids. How creative is a child? How random are they? How, is, how transient is thought in a little person? So you say, what do you want to eat? Um, pasta. So you cook pasta, then it comes, they go, what fish fingers? <laughs> well, 15 minutes ago you said you wanted pasta, and they're kind of going, well, that was that thought, this is this thought. <laughs> and then you say, you do not change your mind. Your father has slaved over that pasta, you eat your pasta. So we, we learn to stick thought together, right? Um, or how resilient they are, how V-shaped they are. You know, you're going around the supermarket, they take something off the shelves, you go, don't put that back. They go, ah! Right, and you think, I'm going to have a chat with you when we get home about this. Right? And you get home, they've completely forgotten they had a little strop. And they're sort of saying, well, that was then, this is now. Why are you still harking on about that? That was just two minutes of me having a tantrum. Are you still on that? <laughs> It seems obvious to them that thought moves. We tell them to stick it together. Right, that's how we get conditioned, right? Um, it's a little bit, you know. But, uh, so you, you can start to see, oh yeah. Now for business people, or for us grown-up adults, who have been told for many, many years that basically good ideas are out there and you have to kind of absorb them, and to take yourself very seriously, Right. We, we do get taught that we're, to be a responsible adult, you have to take your thinking seriously, and you can't possibly let thinking go, because there might be something important about it in the outside world. Well, if you're a responsible parent, you don't, get, you don't just let your thinking go about your money. You have to hold on to it. It's, you know, you're a responsible person. So, so we get taught that thinking needs to be you know, stuck to and kept and taken seriously and all that kind of stuff. We don't really get pointed to the idea that there's this, this infinite source of realisation that's buzzing away in the background, doing a wonderful job. Now, ironically, we let it do all the important stuff, like Ian was saying earlier. We let it do our breathing, our digestion, our heart. We don't get involved in those. But somehow we don't think that's applicable for making a decision about how to deal with a difficult customer. Oh, I can't deal with that. No, no, I can't leave that to a whim. I'll let it do my whole blood circulation system, <laughs> but I won't let it, you know. So, so we, we have to get people to see that that's what they're up to. Now, I or myself or you can point that to people, but until they see it for themselves insightfully, it doesn't really land. It, it, it's the metaphor of, um, I can't remember whose this is, but I borrowed it from someone. If you go on safari, you know, you're trying to see the big five, and, and maybe the guide can go, well, there's a hippo over there. You can't see the hippo for the other person. You can't go, well, I can see it. Oh, I have my eyes. You, you can't see it for them. And they're going, where is it? But you can go, well, it's not over there. It's over there. You can do that bit, but you can't see it for someone. And I think one of the wonderful differences about this approach 
is that once people see it, it does all the heavy lifting for you, metaphorically. Now, as a coach, I used to be, get quite concerned, and maybe not concerned is the wrong word, but attached to my client's outcome, or attached to my outcome as being a good coach, right? <coughs> Thinking, well, I hope my techniques are up to it. This, is, this guy's tricky, right? Uh, or trying to work out what there really was going on for them, trying to work out, well, what are they on? What, what's, what's their real goal here? You know, what, what's the real belief I need to get in and change for them? That was what I, I was kind of detectively working it out. Now it's so simple. I point them in a direction, and, and they do the rest. So simple. It's like if you were, co if, if you were coaching Mozart, and let's, forget, let's imagine he'd forgotten he was Mozart, and you're saying, I want to learn how to play the piano, but I don't know how. I want to learn how to compose. But you knew they were Mozart. You wouldn't try mentoring them about piano techniques. You'd kind of go, well, you know how to do this. Right? But you, you, you'd feel all right in that situation because you know they're Mozart. Right? You know they're actually really quite good. They've just forgotten. Now, I think as <laughs> human beings, we've forgotten. Well, we don't see that we've all got it inside. So, so the role now, OK, is rather than trying to point people to a way of being in the workplace, you know, more effective leadership behaviours, blah, blah, blah. We're pointing to the fact that it all takes care of itself once you understand the variable of quality of mind. When you're down the bottom in quality of mind, you can't see it. When you're at the top, it all takes care of itself. And what we're doing when we're having a, a, a leadership retreat or a coaching session, what we're trying to do is help people point that to people out. And once you start seeing it, you'll start seeing it everywhere. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And it catches fire for people. It kind of, and they fall awake to it. And once they fall awake to it, they're away. And all then you're doing is just giving a little nudge here, a little nudge here. The challenge, or the opportunity, is that we've got some pretty big hard drives going on, especially in, in the workplace. So you're helping people understand what that's doing. So. I'll, I'll give you just a sample. I don't know whether this is going to be an experience, but I'll, I'll give you a sample of what you might be trying to point someone to in a workplace. The listening, I think, is a really good microcosm for this. Um, by the way, how long have I got? Have I got another? Yeah, OK. So, so listening, we get taught a lot on how to listen. OK, active listening or whatever. And listening is a key skill for a leader or a manager. We're, we're told that. Yet, I can do a really simple exercise with a leader or a bunch of people and say, OK, I just want you to sit next to that person and just listen. But listen without you having a job to do. Just listen with nothing on your mind. You don't have to do anything. You're not their boss. You're not anything. You're not trying to fix them. Just, and I, I want you just to notice thought. See it come in, see it go out, see it come in, see it go out. Don't do anything to it when it comes in. Now you, so what happens with that? And it's such a simple exercise. And then you say to people, how was that? And they go, well, that was really different. And you go, well, what was different? Well, I didn't, it just felt, and you ask the listener, well, that just felt really good. And just by simply doing that, you are pointing people to realise what is running through their system that they're normally grabbing making meaning out of, and then doing something with. And then you say, well, what happened after a lot of that thought went through? Well, actually, it just felt OK to sit there and, and not do anything. And then, you know, maybe some things came in and came out. But most of us are so busy inside that we can't see that. We can't see that that's getting in the way. And we're, we're told to listen, what I call shopping list listen, which is bananas, milk, butter. And you're kind of repeating it back to yourself. Yeah. And that's fine if you're listening for information. It's not a bad way of listening, listening for information. But if you're listening to recognise another human being and have insight about what's going on, then you need to listen without your thinking necessarily being attached to. And it, it, it's amazing how... I, I, when I first did that exercise with people, I thought, well, that's just a... That's a bit simple, isn't it? Isn't that just going to be a bit patronising? I'm telling them just to listen with nothing on their mind. But it just keeps blowing me away what people find in that little simple thing. 
And what they start to see is that listening is binary with thinking. What I mean by binary is, you know, binary is, is you can do one or the other, it's black or white, zero or one. Basically, when you're in your personal thinking, you're not being present. You can't do both. We think we can. And for, some, for shopping list listening, it's fine. But if you want to be present to the infinite potential of mind and the other human, which is really the same thing, right? Getting out your own way is massively important. And simple things like that allow the human system to slow down a bit and they hear the simplicity of what we're pointing to. The, the challenge we've got is it's so simple. It took me years to see that. I still don't really see it, right? But I see a bit more than I did. It's so simple. I'm not saying it's easy for people to see. Because it didn't feel easy for me to see it. But it is simple. It's too simple. <laughs> well, I can't be that easy. But if you give people the space, they'll start to see that that challenge they had just disappears. It just looks different because you've raised your consciousness up and it just looks different. And that's the same for any single human being, whether you're talking to them about their, their weight loss or their financial security or a leader of an organisation or whatever it is. And, and you don't, it's quite a light touch. What I used to try and do was talk at them a lot, which is what I'm doing to you now, I realise. But, um, but once they see it, it just sort of takes off and then we'll give them a nudge. And that's the same for the most senior leader or whatever it is. It doesn't make a difference. But there is a way of setting up the conversation to stack the odds in your favour for them to see it. So we've probably got to the end of time a bit quicker than maybe I would have noticed. Um, but if you have questions, and there's two options, we're going to have a little panel session at the end, but please come and grab me, because I realise I might have just dipped you in this a little bit, and you're like, well, we didn't really answer the questions, Piers, but hey, there we go. Um, but I hope there's something in that you find interesting and useful. But it maybe it's just the start of a conversation to have. So thank you for indulging me and listening. Thank you.